Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about language as a system. When we say language, the acquisition process, how we acquire the language, how language comes to us, we never think on, on these terms. It comes to us so naturally that we take it for granted. But it's a very beautiful, complex phenomenon. And, uh, you know, so we are going to talk about language as a system today. But before we talk about language as a system, let us try to understand what is language itself. So many scholars have, uh, you know, tried to explain language as a phenomena, social phenomena, as a human phenomena. But we'll talk about a few important perspectives, like Sapir, Edward Sapir. So he says language is a purely human and non-instinctive method of communication by means of voluntarily produced symbols. Now we need to understand these two very crucial words in this statement, purely human. This is one and number two, voluntarily produced symbols. So, Sapir considers language to be purely human and uh, the noises that we make are, you know, voluntary. We, we make voluntarily these noises and we arrange these noises into certain strings uh, which give us certain meaning and then they are further combined at different levels and we socialize, interact and communicate. The other statement by Bloch and Trager in 1942, they, talk, they say language is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols by means of which a social group cooperates. Now a new word now introduced here, arbitrary, we will come to it later. But again vocal symbols voluntarily produced. But these symbols are arbitrary in nature and uh, he also emphasizes, they also emphasize on the social aspect of it, that we need language to socialize, interact and communicate, share. Then R. A. Hall, he says, language is the institution whereby humans communicate and interact with each other by means of habitually used oral auditory symbols. So everyone is talking about vocal symbol, auditory symbol, oral auditory symbol. But another important perspective added in this statement is the institution, the word institution. And when we say institution, he is emphasizing on social function of language, language which is socially culturally rooted. Then we have uh, Chomskyan perspective and he says language is a set of sentences each finite in length and constructed out of finite set of elements. Uh, if you look at the total number of sounds in a language they are limited. For example in English we have 20 vowels and 24 consonants, 44 sounds. But can we actually count the number of words that we have in English or can we actually count the number of sentences we have produced so far in English? So look at the, you know, infinite creativity of, of the phenomena called language, English language for that matter, here, that with limited set of sounds, we are able to create unlimited number of words. We keep on adding new words every time, right? So. Chomskyan perspective gives us uh, a structural dependency phenomena in language that language is 
uh, you know, structurally dependent, rule governed, and uh, it allows us to create infinite number of utterances and words with finite set of linguistic elements available in the language. Uh, a very important perspective with which the modern linguistic discussions began by Sassur, who said, language is a system of contrasts and equivalence, right? Uh, so out of all these perspective, what can we deduct? Right? What can we deduct out of all these perspectives? First thing that we understand is language is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols. When we say vocal symbols, that means we are talking about noises, the sounds that we produce. Right? These sound, sounds individually do not carry any meaning, they don't have any meaning. But they are the minimal units combined together to create larger units and then meaningful units out of it. Then the second deduction that we can make out of it is that sounds are produced and received in oral auditory channel, oral and auditory, the, the reception. So we have oral and auditory channels and these sounds are produced and received in this channel. Another deduction that we can make out of it is that these vocal symbols which are units of sound are distinct discrete and distinguishable. So each sound that a language has is distinct and unique and they contrast with each other. And because they contrast with each other, this is the reason why we are able to find the word boundaries, right? Where one word ends, where one chunk of this meaningful string ends and the other begins. Each of these sounds are unique, discrete in nature and we can identify them. They are in contrast and opposition. Like pa and ba for that matter, ka and ga, right? Sa and cha. So these sounds are separate, independent, distinguishable, and discrete. Then we can deduct out of all these perspectives that the sounds of a language combine and organize into meaningful strings. Individually, these sounds don't have any meaning. Ka doesn't mean anything for that matter, or pa doesn't mean anything for that matter. Right? So, when we say a word like cow, right? How you spell it, how you write it? C O W. Three letters. But sound is ka. Right? A and O. So, ka, a, and O. Cow. Now, ka individually doesn't mean anything, right? A individually doesn't mean anything, and U individually doesn't mean anything. But they together, in a particular combination, create a string which has some meaning. And uh, it refers to an animal, right? We have mental images of that animal, and we can relate to that mental image of a cow. So when we say cow, it triggers an image and we get some correlation with this this sound called this string of sound called cow and an objective reality that is called an animal and we can relate the two. So this is how this they create meaning out of it. And then such constructions continue this combination continues at high levels. So, meaning strings of meaning in words, then in these words are combined into phrases, then these phrases are combined into clauses, sentences, and then multiple sentences combined into paragraphs, whole discourse. Right? Uh, another set of deductions that we continue making out of it is that it has communication functions. Of course, it has communication functions, it has social functions. Right? So, so, language has social function. And uh, language is the best endowment to a human being. Right? Can you imagine a situation 
like we have mobile phones we have a watch i'm wearing a watch here a pen or shirt or my car or any worldly things material things that you have commodities that you have so let us imagine that language is also and it's hypothetical so let us imagine that language is also such kind of commodity that we have uh, you know and we use so all other commodities and things material possessions that we have like you know money or gold or things can be taken away so let us imagine a situation where uh, your language can be taken away so one fine night you sleep and then somehow someone steals your language you are robbed of your language just let us imagine which is not possible in reality but let us imagine that you can be stolen uh, this can be stolen from you out of you what will happen how do we react to it this is hypothetical situation how do you react can we imagine our life even a single day without language that is the significance of language in our life right that is the centrality of language in our everyday interaction you can't imagine a single day without language it comes to us so naturally that we take it for granted but it has a very crucial social function the social configuration social networks uh, you know are strengthened and carried out and established in terms of linguistic interactions patterns of interactions right so we'll we'll talk about all these things in late classes but today uh, it has definitely social function it is purely human because you know uh, language is the best endowment that we have right uh, it is called an institution keeping in mind the fact that language that is used by a particular society is part of that society's culture so languages are culturally rooted socially rooted and they reflect the structures of a language a particular language reflects structure of that society right configuration of that society the way you interact the way you greet the way you meet and socialize all these patterns so the social elements cultural elements are you know embedded and implicitly there when we speak any any particular language so language is socially uh, rooted culturally rooted you cannot take culture out of a language or language out of a culture so they are they have a symbiotic relationship and uh, post chomsky you know era now we all know that language is structure dependent and it's a beautiful faculty of human mind so this is language for you but how all these discussions start if you want to understand the these concepts in modern linguistic debates and discourses we cannot ignore ferdinand de saussure right his life span 1857 to 1913 he was a swiss scholar a swiss scholar of sanskrit and uh, you know incidentally he was assigned the task to teach linguistics he taught linguistics and by the way he did not write the book but after his death in 1913 after 3 years based on his class lectures his students created this book posthumously and uh, that is called a course in general linguistics which was published in 1916 and that became the reference point for discussion in these terms in modern linguistics and he is also considered as father of modern linguistics uh and perhaps you know that's that's the that's the phase where we refer to a structuralism where language was considered a uh, structure dependent rule governed phenomena so he talked in terms of sign signifier and signified so cow a vocal symbol three vocal symbols ka a u 
and they signify a particular animal. It, that, it, it, that these, 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 these sounds in a string trigger a mental image. But then arbitrary, if you remember the word we talked about in the beginning, arbitrary. The relationship between signifier, like cow, the word, and signified the animal it refers or represents in our mental uh, in images, they are, they, there is no direct relationship between these two. So signifier and signified cow as a word and cow as an animal, they do not have corresponding relationship. So arbitrary, right? So this is arbitrary relationship. There is no one-to-one -one relationship. It why cow is a cow, why pen is a pen, watch is a watch. No idea. This is how you name. And uh, when you name, then the same mental image is triggered in the speaker's mind as well as the listener's mind. This relationship is arbitrary, signifier and signified. Uh, he said meaning is fixed and the structure and there is a structure followed by language. She introduced concepts of binary oppositions in language like signifier and signified, long and parole, synchrony and diachrony, paradigm and syntagm. So we'll talk about all this in future videos. But Ferdinand de Saussure is the reference point for discussion on modern linguistics and also understanding language as a phenomena, a structural phenomena, right? How language is, has a structure and is rule governed and uh, how it represents the objective reality, right? So this is, this is the reference point in modern linguistics. Uh, so, so language as a system, right? Uh, began with Saussure and also carried forward by Malda and Harvey. They published an article in 1975. The reference is there in the slide you can see, right? And their idea of language as a system has, in 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 you know, uh, in its in its fundamental belief. They talk about functions, social functions of language. Because you know, Malda, Malda uh, you know, talked about you know, you know, system of semiotics. You know, and uh, from there it is derived, language as a system. Right? This idea that language is a, is a structure, language is a structure and uh, a definite system also owes to the American structuralism where they talk in terms of building blocks of a language and the levels of representation. And uh, so what are the levels? What are the building blocks? Sounds, right? Sounds are the minimal units of language. Then these sounds are arranged in a particular string, in a particular combination to give certain meaning. So, then we reach another level where these sounds are combined and called you know, words. Then these words are combined into utterances and sentences, right? So, phonology, the minimal unit of language called sounds where we study sounds. Then the second level is morphology where these sounds are arranged in a particular meaningful combination. Then we reach the level of syntax, third level, where these meaningful units called words are arranged in a particular combination, right, governed by certain rules of the language to give you sentences. Then semantics, it talks about meaning, right, and how meaning is derived out of these structures. So first three levels, phonology, morphology, syntax, they refer to structure. The two levels, semantics, and then finally pragmatics, the way we understand these utterances and sentences in a real world situation.
pragmatics. So they talk in terms of these five levels of representation and uh, they are the building blocks of a language. Now, you can understand language in terms of human anatomy. Let us imagine human anatomy where we have multiple systems. So human anatomy is a single system, right? And then within this single system, we have multiple systems like our nervous system for that matter, digestive system for that matter, kidney functions and all other organs and uh, functions they have. So they do not have, they are not inter uh, independent, all this nervous system is not independent, digestive system is not independent, right? Heart functions, but not independently kidney functions, but not independently. So human anatomy, when you say, is a system. If you, if you believe that human anatomy is a system, then it is made of multiple subsystems, like nervous system, like digestive system, and so on. But it is interesting to note that these systems are not independent systems. These, these systems are interdependent systems. Right, and when we are healthy and heart hearty, and when we are uh, functioning, that means entire system is functioning. And how it is functioning? These systems are all the subsystems in the human anatomy are in symbiotic relationship. They are interdependent, and they function interdependently, and constituting the whole human anatomy as a single system. Exactly in the similar analogy, we can understand language. So, language has system of sounds. Language has system and rules of combining these sounds into words. Language has a system of combining these words into larger strings and chunks called utterances or sentences. Then, each of these systems are the system within their own right, right? Like for example, sound system of a language. It is a whole system within its own right because there are certain restrictions put on combining these sounds in a particular manner. Cow, ka, a, u. But can we say, let's say, if you go by spelling, C or W, can we say W O C C W O O W C? So it there are certain restrictions, right? And then what it represents in the objective world, in objective reality. So sound system of a language is a complete system in itself. Then we come to meaningful chunks, how they are combined together. So they are called morphemes, right? The minimal, meaningful unit. If you say sound, each individual sound doesn't carry any meaning. But, like for example, past forming morphemes like suffixes like ed, kill a verb, and we attach ed morpheme, it becomes killed past tense, right? So morphology or the how the words are formed so the entire word formation processes uh, how the verbs are inflected right how new words are formed what are the restrictions applied on them how meanings are derived so morphology in itself is a system it's in its own right right or syntax right uh, so syntax in itself is a whole system, rule governed, right? So, we can say that based on our human analogy, uh, anatomy analogy, we can, we can say that language is also a complete system of multiple smaller subsystems. So, system within system, right? So, language is considered as a system primarily because it is made of linguistic units or components that are interdependent of each other. So they are not independent, right? Uh, language has a smaller units, 
working within a whole system like human anatomy we just talked about and it becomes a system of multiple subsystems like you know morphology phonology syntax semantics pragmatics lexicology so these are all subsystems uh, it is different thing that, that all these subsystems are system within their own right but they all together interdependently work to give you the phenomena called language right it consists of interdependent systems that only become fully meaningful when they are combined imagine if if any deficiency in any of the systems in our anatomy right we are sick we are ill the system does not function properly so all these subsystems of a language are interdependent symbiotic and they function with perfect harmony right then only you get a language as a solid single system okay uh, each of these subsystems contains an organized network of elements in its own right that work together to serve a purpose and accomplish an objective called communication or interaction or socialization right uh, so we have talked about all these things phonology for that matter we just talked that uh, it's all about the sounds of a language their nature their characteristics the restrictions on combinations right now sounds individually don't mean anything but you know the rules that govern putting the sounds in particular string what are the restrictions the properties of the sounds place of articulation of the sounds manner of articulation of the sounds so these are all part of phonology as a subsystem then morphology the rules for word formation also has its own subsystem of morphemes and uh, morphology studies how words are constructed from morphemes units of meaning small units of meaning so it is a system in its own right right then lexicology right part of morphology syntax the combination of these words or meaningful units into larger units called sentence right so rules for word order and arrangements in a structure particular structure right uh, then semantics very crucial thing the meaning part of part of the strings or the or this or the smaller structures so it has a subsystem of its own based on vocabulary and word lex, uh, you know localization semantics is all about the meaning that are expressed through words and syntax uh, always remember meaning of a particular we'll talk in pragmatics when we talk about pragmatics the total meaning of a sentence is not meaning of a sentence is not total sum of the individual words meaning of individual words so pragmatics talks about how you interpret these meanings combination of these meanings in a particular structure in a real world situation right and it becomes visible in terms of metaphors and the idioms that we use in a particular culture because metaphors and idioms are culturally sensitive and uh, you know we all uh, if you are not familiar with the culture if you are not familiar with the with the society and the context in which it is being used you won't be able to derive meaning out of it because the meaning of a sentence uh, is not the total sum of meaning of individual words right a very famous sentence by chomsky like you know colorless green ideas sleep furiously it's a syntactic structure it's a sentence colorless green ideas sleep furiously so each of the words in, in this particular sentence has some meaning it's colorless has a meaning something without color green name of a color and we all understand what is green then ideas we all know 
we all understand ideas as a word and the meaning it correlates with sleep a verb furiously an adverb so colorless green ideas sleep furiously it's whole sentence right what does it mean so you have individual meanings but how it is interpreted can we consider it grammatical can we consider it to be a grammatical sentence in in a language called let's say english can we can take it as an uh, as a, a sentence what is the meaning of the sentence how do we interpret it right because something green cannot be colorless right and then idea there is no point talking about idea in terms of colors whether it is colorless or green right meaningless then sleep verb it's a plus animate word only living beings sleep non living beings for them it's no no use and then furiously this adverb cannot go with sleep because how can we be furious while sleeping right so pragmatics is all about how we interpret the meaning out of a meaningful structure right how we interpret the meaning like for example uh, you know somebody visits you and you say why don't you sit now when you say why don't you sit are you asking a question because if you look at the structure of this sentence it looks like an interrogative sentence why don't you sleep why don't you sit but is it really a question or is it an offer right so we know that it is an offer a guest who visits you and you offer that why don't you sit that means you are offering a seat to the person right how do you understand these structures and meaning how do you derive meaning out of it in the real world situation right uh, and for example in all discourse markers and uh, other elements of the language their roles and their functions in a sentence and how we use that particular structure or word in a particular social context so this is what pragmatics is all about so pragmatic talks about uh, rules of language use how you use it right so one the language or the element linguistic element or linguistic unit its own linguistic function and then how these units are used in a particular context to get you uh, you know the communicative function of it that is what pragmatics talks about so pragmatic looks at how language is used in a context and how meaning can be can vary or be revealed or concealed according to a speaker's situation right so now we all understand uh, language as a system it's a it's a system beautiful i mean chomsky refers to language as you know uh, a structural dependent system where these structures can be met, you know uh, uh, investigated and explained with mathematically algorithmic precision right so it's a structure uh, it's, it's a system complete beautiful system and then this system has multiple subsystems like sound pattern of a language sound system system of sounds so that is called phonology it is a, a complete unit in itself complete system in itself then morphology right the word formation processes how words are created uh, you know and then putting them into sentence larger chunk larger larger structure which is called syntax it is a complete system within itself then how we derive meaning out of these structures 
and uh, that is called semantics is complete system in itself and then how these meanings are interpreted in a real world situation we can call pragmatics so isn't it beautiful to see that phonology morphology syntax semantics and pragmatics these five subsystems together function and in an interdependent way right to give us language as a complete system so you understand today that language is a system it has multiple subsystems all these subsystems together function right uh, and in an interdependent fashion to give us language a complete system